Of course, another date to note today, May 18, with Australia going to the polls in 37 days and the campaign to wade through school holidays, Easter public holiday, Anzac Day public holiday, which makes it likely that the public will be basically mentally checked out for much of the election run-up, let's be honest. Millions of Australians are expected to take advantage of this opportunity we have this year. Remember, 10 days off between Easter and Anzac Day this year if you just take those three key annual leave days. So why and how do politicians campaign to a country in holiday mode? Yeah, it's a good starting point for tonight's Taking Stock. And we're joined by Claire Kimball, founder of The Squiz and former media advisor to Prime Minister Tony Abbott. And also Jack DeLosa, founder of The Entourage and host of Entrepreneurs right here on Your Money. Uh, thank you both very much for being with us. Claire, I might start with you because you've sure. been in these rooms where I they decide, have. right, we want to put this as the date we're going to go with. Indeed. Uh, as Brooke pointed out, there's a lot of uh, annual leave opportunity to be had in these five weeks. Do you think that, that makes a, a key difference and would they have been considering that when they came up with the date? It's hard not to consider that because it's the reality of, of the situation. Um, whether Scott Morrison and the team were planning on shuffling it right down to this end to the last day really that they could get that half Senate election, I wonder because once you got past summer and the New South Wales election, there was really not a lot of wriggle room left. But I don't think it's just the coalition that are delighted that there's a narrowed attention span for this. Um, George Megalogenis today has a really fascinating piece about how governments have changed over the last bit, particularly coalition governments to Labor governments. We had Whitlam on a great rah-rah platform. Mm -hmm. We had Bob Hawke on a great rah-rah platform. And we had Kevin Rudd on yes. a really big platform yeah. of change, we don't, we shorten. There's yep. no great, oh my God, this is going to be amazing. It's mm. just, kind of, let's just all just like quietly slide into the so into that election I think it date. works for everyone. Interesting. Would it have been, so would it have been their, not necessarily their strategy then? I just think we're all exhausted. Yeah, I, I think everyone yeah. has a really, going to have a really hard time. And I think we've, we've talked about this before, Communications are so much more difficult these days, regardless, even if you have people's full attention. So it's a different campaign this time. And I think probably much like we saw here in New South Wales not that long ago, if the incumbents can just try and keep it quiet and they get to election day and everyone's yeah, like, sure. oh, we have to vote, that's probably <laughs> yeah. not a bad outcome. Sure. So it's potentially checked out then uh, for the next few weeks. Jack, is that uh, how you see things? Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with Claire in, on all of that. And I was interested to hear, hear your views, given given your sort of mm. background across this particular mm. space. Uh, like, it's it's impossible not to know that April and May come with a lot of public holidays. Like, I run a medium-sized business, mm. and we're very aware of it because it influences yeah, yeah. so many different mm. marketing sales. Every, every, where people are, are they checking their phones? Mm. Are they checking their email? Yeah. And so, if you're the Prime Minister of Australia, you're aware of it. You're very aware of it. Mm. And I was interested mm. to hear your thoughts, Claire, whether it was an advantage or not. But it's, it's, I, think, I think you hit the nail on the head in, in terms of um, both are interested in a shorter campaign cycle, less time for a uh, scandal to come out, less time for things to go wrong mm. um, and sort of let's get it over and done with type thing. Mm. I think too, like, uh, the things are so tight and we know that for both of them. Um, every day is going to be living a campaign in a stretch on its own just to get through the day intact. If you're doing that over shorter yep. periods of time, yep. that's certainly an advantage for Morrison. And it's I, exactly op the opposite of what Turnbull did, which is this eight extra weeks long of hell eight for everyone. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but I'm interested in what you just said um, <coughs> with the way you work with small businesses. What is what is it? Uh, what's the plan as to the extent to which you think people do tune out in that period? Almost completely. Yeah, right. Yeah, the, it's so e what we're talking about. email mm -hmm. open rates go down. Social media engagement goes down. Social media reach. Mm -hmm. goes down. Really, some people on holidays and just flicking through this social media and that's what you'd think like no. it, well it's and, and maybe if you're a consumer-based product perhaps but yeah obviously sure. I'm in a, a more B2B type B2B, environment yeah. so that, that might influence it but on, on the advantage thing I mean I was wondering uh, Claire sort of pointed to this uh, uh, this sort of conclusion of what you were just saying is is it better for the incumbent to have a shorter cycle mm. because in order for people to change they need a really good reason to change mm. and so maybe that gives the existing incumbent a bit of an advantage over a shorter period of time. Yeah, well, it seems I don't think there's going to be any difference this election to previous ones, which is governments lose elections, oppositions don't win them. Yeah, so right. we're still in that footing, I think. Right. And that's certainly been the experience so far as to why we've seen 
you know, the fortunes of the coalition not so great in the polling. They've done everything they possibly can to lose it. So, <laughs> yep. mm. wait yeah. and see. Interesting intervention as well into the election and a key issue of electric cars by Elon Musk, <laughs> who uh, joined Mike Cannon Brooks in, in throwing their tweets behind Labor's electric car target, which, you know, somewhat surprisingly became the big issue in the yeah. last week. Uh, we know Australian tech has a problem effectively lobbying the government. We've spoken about that on, on this show recently. Is Twitter deployed? Diplomacy getting anywhere? Are we a bit sick of these guys just weighing in on our political debate from afar? Um, we know that Jack is a big Elon Musk fan. This is the best uh, ways to get things done in this country. It doesn't get anything done. Which is a sad it indictment on government. Done. It's it's like they just fixed the energy issue from okay. a conversation that they had over Twitter. Like, they bypassed it's years of government... It's kind of entertaining of government... that they weigh in. It gets a bit of media time. No, but I mean, does it, it get actually a... works. Okay, on South Australia, that's fine. But I mean, this stuff... They're like, just that's a real... Stuff it's not like, oh, that's fine. That's a real example. That's a real example of Musk and the... And um, who was it? Mike uh, Thank you, yep. Mike Cannon-Brooks. Um, using that platform to capture the imagination of the Australian population, to speak directly to Australian politicians and get something done that otherwise would have waited through years of politics and bureaucracy and and so this is brilliant the, the more we can expedite all of these types of conversations and advancements particularly coming from somebody like musk and mike cannon brooks the better yeah. it is interesting but do you like to yeah yeah let's, let's, let's find well out. is that is that mm. less than hurled i mean every rat bag nut bag out in the world would have their agenda picked up and it doesn't work that way. These people would influence no matter what they did, whether it was on Twitter or whether it was mm. picking up the phone or whether it was, you know, mm. heading to the, you know, to the Daily Telly. That's, but, that's the way it But the work. thing yeah. about Twitter is it gets the population immediately aware of it. But the, and the population... Isn't it only journalists on Twitter this, half the time? This yeah. pool, this cesspit of just no, no. complete hell. It's no, no, no. Like, let's look at how many retweets or likes those tweets would have got. You know, like, it's, it's, it's in the hundreds of thousands of... Like, mm. it, this is mm. a serious media these days. It's not something to be written off. Well, Donald it's, it's, Trump it's, certainly thinks so. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, speaking of rap bags. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Sure. Rap bags. <laughs> it seems to work sometimes for these guys, but also we've definitely got a pro problem with tech in Australia lobbying the government. You know, the, the encryption laws went through. They hated that. Uh, the tech CEO is potentially facing jail for some issues. They're hating on that as well. So, you know, do they need to kind of... I know it's it's bureaucracy and it's difficult, but do they need to go through more traditional channels sometimes to get their points across? No, so so that encryption thing is basically saying, and the government do this all the time, they've written regulation which is unclear, that has really harsh penalties, that's going to really limit how much tech companies can employ people and what they can do with content and be competitive, particularly in a global economy. And so it's not that's not the tech companies, in my view, doing anything wrong, particularly not the CEOs doing anything wrong. It's the government can continuing to not understand the current digital environment and misregulating it to such a degree that you get people like Scott Farquhar, for instance, last week, who's Mike Cannon Brooks' business partner in Atlassian, you know, re really voicing that again over Twitter. And it's such a good platform to do that with. But everyone has to, uh, Claire, you know better than anyone, but doesn't everyone have to trudge the corridors of Parliament to get yeah. in these guys' faces? Otherwise, you don't, you don't get really a say in the end because you haven't spent the time and energy that they love, to, yeah. love people to spend on them. Yeah. Uh, and is there an argument that they should be, um, yeah, basically more active in front oh, absolutely. of politicians? Oh, absolutely. And look, I see it from and both sides. And why do they keep getting rolled like, yeah. by Canberra, basically? Mm. Some yeah. Of the pieces that have been out recently. Yeah. yeah, and I think, like, it, it's fascinating, even in this day and age of improved communications and the immediacy of platforms like Twitter, yeah. business doesn't get politics just as much as politics doesn't get business. There's a massive divide and there's a way of politics showing respect and doing the hard yards and having the conversations and all of that that you can't just do over Twitter. It just doesn't work that sure. way. I, I, I think we will start to see that change. I think Adelaide's That's a one terrifying example. day, just, if that's the case. Just, just, if we're opening up all of this to Twitter, it's a terrifying <laughs> it's not, day. It's not that we're opening up <laughs> to Twitter. It's Elon Musk. 
you know so so like if you so in, in this article he spoke about Norway for example and so and so this particular yeah. issue is about can Australia become have half of our cars uh, be electric vehicles in the next 11 years right is, is the current claim mm. which which in itself is is really uninspiring when you start to dig under the hood so yeah. so Norway last month 58% of their cars sold were electric vehicles last month yeah. so they're, they're already there they have and 10 kilometers to drive and you've got from uh, one yeah. end of the country yeah. to the, the next. Distance, <laughs> distance. Even I you could, you could drive from one end of yeah. Australia right now to another in an electric vehicle. Distance, the, the charging stations are so um, sort of frequent mm. along oh, the road. Oh, here we go. So, so distance, <laughs> distance isn't yeah, a challenge. Yeah. And then the, then the second question is, well, how much does Musk actually contribute to this conversation? Is he a real player, you know, or is he a rat bag on Twitter? Yeah, 30% of 30% of Norway's vehicles that were sold last month were Tesla Model 3s. 30%. Mm. The, the second highest seller in Norway uh, represented less than 10%, right? And so Musk has accelerated this conversation and accelerated the advent of electric vehicles globally. He is the number one thought leader in yeah. this space and he's to be taken seriously. But it basically, I think from what I'm gathered, it'll happen anyway, whether Musk says it will or Labor says it will. Or Absolutely. No. Says it, and so it, it, it that, won't I happen think... because Musk said it will. It'll happen because there's a bunch of people who aren't earning 500 grand a year who can afford the technology. And yes, it, that's it will. Issues. It will yeah. happen anyway. But Musk and Tesla have undoubtedly accelerated the advent. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to touch one more time on what we were talking about before with regard to, to tech and votes, because I thought there was a really interesting quote from Mike Cannon-Brooks, who's in uh, Las Vegas right now. He's speaking to David Swan of The Australian. He said, uh, tech is not a vote winner. We have to better explain that tech is a job creator, but we aren't going to be able to do that in the six weeks before the federal election. So they seem pretty acutely aware of the situation uh, that votes aren't won by tech. Mm -hmm. So does that change the messaging uh, through Twitter or wherever it has to be? You can't win, right? Malcolm Turnbull ran an eight-week election campaign yeah. on the innovation election yeah, remember <laughs> and that went nowhere yeah. and these guys were nowhere and here we are yeah. and it's not about six weeks and this is the thing about walking the corridors Jim. this is about a commitment to actually mm. have proper conversations mm. that you can't do in 280 characters mm. innovation is not popular for politicians to push because people don't like change and oh, so and, it's and, not a vote winner it, it, it can actually be the opposite mm. and, which is part of the problem mm. and by the way and the politicians don't get it yeah, a hundred percent. They don't get yeah. caught, yeah. caught but, out. And I'm they've learned a thousand right? times to not stick their head out, yeah. Yeah. particularly yeah. in instances yeah. where they don't get it. Yeah. And, and that's a real yeah. barrier to advancing the whole Which country. Which means yeah. it's a whole lot easier to talk about um, people taking away your utes. <laughs> <laughs> because we all get that, don't we? <laughs> Save the ute. Save the ute. I love that segue. <laughs> uh, no segue. We're actually about to talk about coffee because yeah. the Swiss government has shocked. I mean, this is something we can all understand. The Swiss government has shocked Australians everywhere. In fact, people around the world <laughs> saying coffee is not vital for human survival. Mm. Yes, it's decided <laughs> to dump the nation's emergency coffee stockpile. These emergency reserves were established about 100 years ago and they're basically to draw in the case of war, natural disaster or epidemics. Coffee is out, people. <laughs> Fair call. What do you think, Jack? Oh, yeah, I don't really have a view, but I tell you what <laughs> I, I did. Have a view. <laughs> they're wrong. Coffee in Switzerland. <laughs> they're wrong. No, stop piling it for when the <laughs> world's over. Is that real? <laughs> I tell you what is interesting. So, so the, across the country in Switzerland, they have stockpiled 15,300 tonnes of coffee. It's enough to feed Switzerland for three months their, their three month coffee consumption. Mm. How cool is that? I mean, I couldn't care less whether they have it or not. I just thought that was interesting. Yes, and of course you have to say, but oppo months. opposition is brewing, of course, mm. as they say, Claire. Love that. Love that. I, mean, I just don't understand that the first thing that came out of his mouth was that's a stupid idea. We all need coffee. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, I guess coffee's not essential, just like, you know, love isn't. I mean, it's absolutely <laughs> essential <laughs> to life. These things are necessary. I just I mean, love it. Protest like, on the street. Like the the world's over. We have no channels in. Exactly. We 
have no food, but we've got no. the three months worth of coffee. I think it's amazing. You know, don't worry that yeah. we don't have internet or access to banking. No, no. We've, we've got, got our coffee. But we've yeah. got Twitter and electric car. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be on coffee at the time at the end of the world. No, but as someone pointed out, whoever is on the coffee wins the war. Yeah, well. So, I mean, it's a straight right. idea, really. There we go. Totally. That's a good point, exactly. <laughs> it's a military oh, play. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, exactly. Okay, great fun. Thank you very much, guys. Jack Delosa. Thank you, Claire Kimball. Much appreciated. <laughs> Thank you. Until next time. Yeah. Uh